this is what it truly really means to be free in Christ. John 8 verse 38 says, So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17 declares, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And there is this bishop who boldly declares this. His name is J.C. Rao, and he says this, No power on earth can prevent a man or a woman from receiving through freedom if they have but the will to receive it. Tyrants may threaten and cast in prison, but nothing they can do can stop a person from receiving the liberty that Christ gives. And once it is ours, nothing can take it away. Men may torture us, banish us, hang us, behave us, burn us, but they can never take from us through freedom. Laws cannot deprive us of it because once it is ours, it is an everlasting possession. Here in this land, we are privileged to have freedom of worship. And I think we must continually give thanks to God for this outward freedom that we enjoy because freedom of religion is really a gift to be celebrated, isn't it? It is something that we should not take for granted, especially in the light of the fact that Christians in more than 60 countries around the world are denied religious freedom. And Open Doors reports that 215 million Christians around the world are either experiencing high, very high, or extreme persecution. And yet, despite the restriction of outward freedom, Christians in these persecu persecuted nations continue to grow at a rapid, rapid rate. And obviously, they possess an inner freedom that is not inhibited by the lack of outward freedom to practice and proclaim their faith. And it is ironic that Christians in non-restricted parts of the world they have all the freedom to worship Christ, and yet they are far from growing by leaps and bounds. And in fact, they are growing at a rate that is much slower than the persecuted church. With all the freedom that we possess, we should expect great growth, isn't it? But sadly, that is not the case. Perhaps the question we need to ask ourselves this evening is this. While we enjoy an outward freedom of worship, do we really possess inward freedom, the kind that characterize our persecuted brethren? You know, we have the very simple freedom of being able to own a Bible and to read it whenever we want to. But do we really read it for all it's worth? We have all the privilege and freedom to attend worship service, prayer meeting, and live group meetings. But do we come with a sense of expectation or do we sometimes have that sense of drudgery that it is one more meeting for us to attend? We have the freedom to witness to others around us and yet, do we see so of every opportuni opportunity to witness to our loved ones or are we just too busy with our own things to be able to find the time to do so. You know, on the Sunday that Pastor Chiving shared his message on watch for him, um, the Lord spoke to me very distinctly during the time of altar call. And it was just one simple statement that says, go back to where you came from. And um, as I reflected on it, I, I was reminded or rather the Lord reminded me of my early beginnings when I accepted Christ and I, and I was led to retrace my steps back to where I first started out in my journey of faith. And today, here's a little bit about my story. When I was about 10, one of my sisters accepted Christ at a school Christian fellowship and um, she shared the gospel with me and my siblings and that resulted in about five of us girls out of a football team, 
we gave our hearts to Jesus all at the same time. But our journey of faith was a rather challenging one. My parents, staunch Buddhist Taoists who were steeped in idolatry, strongly objected to our decision to become Christians. We were not allowed to believe in Jesus, and so we could not practice our faith. Problems abound at home, and the issue of religion added further fuel to it. And so for 10 years, we went underground. But though the door was closed shut, God opened many doors, many windows of opportunities for us to grow in our faith. Initially, we had only one Bible, a big cow, big cow living Bible, which we all took turns to read. And uh, we had to be on the alert each time we read the Bible. And whenever we saw uh, either of my parents coming to the dining area, which also doubled as the study room, we would quickly put the Bible back on the shelf among the encyclopedias and the complete works of Shakespeare. It looked like any other reference book. And so as time went by, we decided we had to buy a couple of more Bibles. We bought Good News Bible. But because you know why, sharing one Bible among six people is definitely, was definitely not a good idea. Some people took too long to do their devotions at the expense of others. Sounds crazy, right? So later on, and I, get, I suppose you know where the hiding place was. Yes, among the, bo the books, the complete works of Shakespeare. That's where we hid all the Bibles. And later on, we started buying Christian books and um, we wrapped them very nicely in brown paper to make them look like textbooks. How many of you l lived in the era of brown paper? Oh my goodness, so few, <laughs> you would know, right, how we used to wrap our textbooks with brown paper. So one look at the brown paper, you would think that that's a textbook. And so later on in my upper secondary, I became a subs regular subscriber of the Voice of the Martyrs. Now with all our incoming mails scrutinized, I leave it to you to figure out how I managed to get hold of the newsletter. But it greatly encouraged me in my faith, and especially one of the books that they sent, Tortured for Christ by Richard Wimbrun. Um, that was a great source of encouragement to me. You can download it free at pdfdrive.net, and I think every Christian should read this book. You will be greatly inspired by the faith of our, pers of the, our persecuted brethren. Now, you know, the more restraints we had, the more resourceful we became. If there's a will, right, you will somehow always find a way. I, despite many restrictions, I joined the Christian Fellowship as part of the extracurricular activities in school, and I served as the secretary. And, um, you know, I was reminded that if the heart is willing, God will somehow provide a way for us to serve in spite of our circumstances. And, Thank God, you know, all those many years, my parents never queried what kind of extra curricular activities I was involved in by the grace of God. And on Fridays, I had um, BM tuition, and that gave me an excuse to stay back in school and sneak off to CA's, Christ Ambassadors meeting before my tuition. Now, that's back in Ipoh. Uh, that was back in the church in Ipoh. That was really a huge risk. The church van would go round to the nearby schools and then they would fetch students for the youth meetings. And one unfortunate Friday, the meeting was prolonged, but I had to leave for tuition, right? So there was no car, no van available, and so they arranged for one of the older youth to send me back to school on a motorbike. And I thought that was really a bad idea. But what to do? No choice, right? So, and guess what happened when I was dropped off at the school side entrance? I heard a very loud honk, and I turned, and much to my horror, I saw my father's driver honking at me. He was supposed to have sent me for tuition. Of course, I was overtaken by fear, and uh, I made my way slowly to the car, and feeling much like a lamb led to be slaughtered. And I thought to myself, 
I am finished this time. <laughs> it's either I will read if, if he tells my dad, I'm going to get it. I will get it either for secretly dating or for going to church. Now I have to decide which I will be slaughtered for. <laughs> so, and all the way in the car, you know, my heart was beating very fast. And I just prayed. I said, God, please have mercy. And will you please seal his mouth shut in the name of Jesus? God, in his divine mercy, answered prayers, and he never spilled the beans. But that one glare that he gave me was enough to send me the message that I, better be, I had better behave if I knew what was good for me. Well, thank the Lord for that. So the time came when we decided to make a stand for our faith once and for all, regardless of the outcome. And uh, we spent months of months in prayer. But the only time we could pray together was uh, during the wee hours of the morning or when my parents were out. So we, had, we decided that we had to wake up in the middle of the night to pray. It was tough waking up at ungodly hours and even quite a challenge staying awake during prayer time. And sometimes I find myself dozing off in slumberland and then there would be a tug on my hand and say, wake up, it's your turn to pray. But you know, despite our frailty, God saw our heart's desire for our family members to be safe and especially my parents. And He was faithful to answer our prayers. And my parents finally accepted our decision to become Christians after a long struggle. It was hard, it was really hard. At times, I feared for our safety, but God protected us. We were eventually allowed to go to church, but only once a month. And how we looked forward to going to, going to church each time our, our turn came. And whoever attended the church service would come back, share the rest of the message with us, and so we would all be blessed. Now, later on, we were allowed to go to church weekly, then we were allowed to attend prayer meeting, live group meeting, and everything Christian. Fast forward, a few years later, four of us girls responded to the call to full-time ministry and one by one in the family gave their hearts to Jesus and the most amazing was the salvation of my parents when I was studying at BCM. Today, there remains two out of the football team yet to be saved. The referees have long gone to be with the Lord. <laughs> As I was recounting, those difficult but memorable years, you know, I realized something. I realized that I have, to a certain extent, lost the simplicity of the early years that were characterized by a raw passion, zeal, and hunger for God and His Word. I think my faith now has become more complicated, more sophisticated, with much theology. And much of the Word has become so familiar over the years that I fear that there is an overexposure and but an under-response to the Word of God at times. I have become too well-fed spiritually to be hungry sometimes. When I did not have the physical or the outward freedom to practice my faith back then, I realized that I actually experienced more freedom within to um, more freedom within because I was so open to receive from the Lord, so hungry for the Word, so desperate for God to manifest His presence, so utterly dependent on Him, and so simple in my faith and obedience. You know, when we don't have the freedom to do something, we tend to cherish every moment of opportunity that we get to do it. But when we have the freedom to, all the freedom to do it, somehow the urgency is not there. We tend to take things for granted and we therefore fail to maximize the freedom that we have to do what we want to do. Somewhere along the line, we have forgotten the price we paid or the price that someone else paid for that freedom. Some of you here, how many of you here are first generation Christians? Yeah, I see many hands. Those of you who are first generation Christians, you will remember the price you had to pay for the freedom to practice your faith. And just as the Holy Spirit spoke to me, I believe that every once in a while, we need to go back to where we came from. 
to recapture the simplicity and the passion of the early years of our journey of faith. Now, we may need to or we may not need to do that depending on where we are in our journey with the Lord. But if there's one thing that we ought not to forget, it is the fact that our spiritual freedom came with a very heavy price. It was a price so heavy that none of us could pay it. And we owe it to the one who paid the price for our freedom. The one who gave us the gift of freedom in the first place. Let's take a little look at the gift of freedom. You know, one of the gift of freedom is one of God's greater gifts to make humankind, without which we will be no much better than robots, isn't it? Yet, on the other hand, that gift of freedom comes with the, an amazing potential to do good or the destructive ability to do great evil. And if you look at the Bible, God's gift of human freedom began in the creation account in Genesis 1 to 2. In the Garden of Eden, we know that Adam and Eve were given freedom within defined limits, and God made it clear that they were not to eat the fruit of the tree of, no of knowledge of good and evil. But the temptation of the serpent to eat the fruit and to be like God caused them to go beyond the boundary in their quest to expand the dimensions of human freedom. And what was the result? The result was the tragic fall and the entry of sin into the world. Then, when human conscience failed to provide the needed limits to human freedom, God gave the law with its dual message of you shall or, and you shall not. But sinful men broke the law, preferring to interpret life in their own way and live on their own terms. And so, human freedom ceased to be the gift of, of God to be the gift God had intended and in deteriorated into a curse of unimaginable proportions. But even in the midst of the most tragic failures, God never withdrew human freedom. He offered grace. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in the place of sinful men, to appease His wrath. And so, Christ came to, came to set us free, and He reversed the tragedy of the fall. And what was the tragedy? The tragedy was, of the fall was where liberty became a license to sin and the divine limit that God has placed was trespassed in a quest to expand the dimensions of human freedom. 1 Timothy 2 verse 6 tells us that Jesus gave his life to purchase freedom for every one of us. And he came inviting giving the invitation to all to choose whether or not they would follow him. And this calls for a decision on our part. Through grace, we are enabled to recognize and to respond to God's call. What did it cost Jesus to purchase our freedom? We know that he sacrificed untold glory and splendor in heaven to walk among us. In his final days, he endured more physical and emotional pain that we could ever imagine. He experienced the spiritual pain of having to be separated from his father while he was hanging on the cross and he paid for our sins with his own blood. So when we look at it, the gift of freedom isn't free. It came with the highest of cause and the greatest sacrifice. And with freedom comes responsibility, not to do as we like, but as we ought to, based on the revealed will and purpose of God. A responsibility of freedom. John 1 verse 12 tells us that to all who believed in Him, Jesus, and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. But not here that the privilege of being God's children comes with the responsibility of obeying His word. In John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him, He said, If you abide in My word, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In other words, true freedom comes from knowing Christ 
through genuine faith and abiding in His Word. It's not enough to just believe, to know in our heads or to believe in our hearts, but we need to live out what we believe. The Jews with whom Jesus was speaking to thought they were spiritually free by virtue of the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. But Jesus pointed out to them that if we, they were the descendants of Abraham, they would do the very things that Abraham did rather than plotting evil. But as they it were, they might be in the household of God. But because of sin, they were in God's household as slaves and not true sons. We know that slaves don't enjoy full privileges. They can be expelled from the household at any time when they do something wrong. So in a nutshell, this is what Jesus meant. If we are not abiding in His word, we may still be in God's household, but we are slaves rather than true sons. And we could lose our status anytime if we continue in our ungodly ways. And that is not true freedom. Because the Bible tells us that if the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. Free from every past entanglement. And that's what Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So, what does true freedom look like? I like what the author and pastor John Piper says. He describes true freedom this way. He says, you are fully free when you have the desire, the the ability and the opportunity to do what will leave you with no regrets forever. What does he mean by that? It means that if you don't have a desire, if you don't have the desire to do a thing, you are not fully free to do it. Well, you may master the willpower to do what you don't want to do, but nobody calls that true freedom. And if you have the desire to do something, but no ability to do it, you are not free to do it. And if you have the desire and the ability to do something, but no opportunity to do it, you are not free to do it. But if you have the desire to do something, you have the ability to do it, you have the opportunity to do it, and it destroys you in the end, you are not fully free. Not free indeed. I thought that makes a lot of sense. In other words, if we use our freedom to do something that will destroy us in the end, that is not true freedom. You can have all the desire, all the ability, all the the opportunity to do what you want to do, but if it destroys you in the end, that is not true freedom. But if we use our freedom to do good that will benefit others and further the cause of the kingdom of God, that is true freedom. In other words, true Christian liberty or freedom gives us a purpose, not a license. True Christian freedom gives us a purpose, not a license. It frees us not only from something, but to something. Freedom is for something, isn't it? So Christ has set us free from guilt and the bondage of sin, but not in order that we might be enslaved to the very sins for which Christ has redeemed us from. God has meant for the Christian to be free for a God-given purpose. And this brings us to the two sides of freedom. There are two sides of freedom, freedom from and freedom to. And these two sides of freedom, you will find Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. They are both the two sides of the same freedom coin. Freedom from. To be set free from something is just one side of freedom. That's not the end goal. It's not complete without the freedom to be. So let's just take a very simple example. Say we are in deep debt. True financial freedom does not mean just being free from debt. But because there is this, we can always get into debt again because of our covetous nature. So, True financial freedom entails not only being free from that, but it also entails us being set free from the love of money 
so that we can be what? We can be good stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to us so that we can be good stewards who will use the resources wisely for the purposes of God's kingdom. And this is precisely what Paul wants to bring across in Galatians chapter 5. And he explains that now that we have been set free, we should not use our freedom to satisfy our sinful nature. We are to stop gratifying the desires of the flesh. And he gives a whole long list of that passions and desires that we need to crucify in verses 19 to 21. He says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warned you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So, we have been set free from the bondage of sin to be what? Let's take a look at what Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 14 says. And Paul cites the purpose for our freedom here. He says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. To the world, right? Freedom means the right to be. The right to be and do as you please, how you please, when you please, where you please. It means doing your own thing, being your own boss and taking care of your self-interest. But... Such a philosophy, right, always results in non-loving, selfish exploitation that ignores the needs of others and acts in ways that are harmful to the body of Christ and God's purpose for the church. And Paul gives us a more excellent reason to be set free from our slavery to sin. He says we are called to liberty, not to do as we please, but to serve one another in love. So in a nutshell, we are set free we are to be set free from sin to be loving people who serve others because this is God's command to us. But he also recognises that at the same time, it is quite difficult for us to set aside our self-interest and to serve others in love. And that is why he gives this exhortation in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. And he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each, uh, with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So the only way we can overcome the flesh is by making room for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. And as we walk in step in the, with the spirit, we will be set free from the carnal desires of the flesh and the Holy Spirit will help us to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So, the real evidence that we are experiencing true freedom in Christ is not just that we have been set free from the bondage of sin, but it is the fact that we are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And Paul goes on, further to talk about being generous and seizing the opportunity to do good to all in Galatians chapter 6. Now, if we follow Paul's train of thought, what he is really saying in a nutshell is this. True freedom in Christ is evidenced by the freedom from the bondage of sin and the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives that will result in the freedom to do the good that God has intended for us to do. And so the question we need to ask ourselves this evening is this, am I walking in the Spirit or am I walking in the ways of the flesh? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in my life? Am I who God has intended for me to be? And am I doing the good that He has called me to do? So, in conclusion, what am I doing with the freedom that God has given me? What are you doing with the freedom that God has given you? Are you wasting your freedom by 
satisfying the desires of your own flesh and doing what pleases you? Or are you maximizing the freedom He has given you to seek first His kingdom and to further the purposes of His kingdom? You know, we can never take our freedom for granted because we never know when that freedom can be taken from us. It may not necessarily be by a sudden change in the law, but it can be by sudden death or by a sudden um, debilitating disease that immobilizes us. And I would just like to end by sharing this. Last year, I was at a wake service of one of my good friends who was my former colleague. And um, at the wake service, I was talking to the husband. He was also my former colleague. And um, I was trying to catch up on the many years we had not been in touch. And he had a sad story to tell. And, you know, he was showing me um, a very large card that was signed by m many names of children. And he told me that uh, those were refugee children that the wife was trying to reach out to. And did you know that he never even knew that the wife was reaching out to those ref refugee kids? He only discovered it when she died. And... Um, it was a sad story, and he said this to me with much regret. He said, you know, there were so many things that she actually wanted to do for the Lord, but many times I was the one who stood in the way. I was the stumbling block that hindered her from doing all the good that God wanted her to do. And I say this to parents today, don't be a stumbling block to your children. If your children wants to serve God full time, or they want to serve the Lord actively in church. And I say this to husbands, do not be a stumbling block in the, in, to your wife if she wants to serve God actively. And I say the same to wives as well. And for the rest of us, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Are we the one standing in the way of us maximizing the freedom that God has given us to do all the good that He has called us to do. And that's basically the trust of my message. Because, you know, as long as we have this freedom, we must celebrate the gift of freedom and live out our freedom to the fullest. So that at the end of the day, when we stand before the one who paid the price for our freedom with his life, he will be pleased to see that we have not misused this freedom to fulfill our own desires and our selfish pursuits, but we have maximized this freedom to further the purposes of His kingdom. If the musicians will come back right now, and if you just close your eyes for a few moments. God has given you the freedom to have a relationship with Him, but somehow the relationship is not fresh, and you want a fresh touch. That's the first group. Second group is, you know, the Lord has set you free and you want to do good. And this, especially this Chinese New Year season, you're saying to the Lord, you have set me free from sin. My friends, my relatives don't know you. And you want to bring a friend, a relative before the Lord. And you want to bring yourself before the Lord. The third group are those of us who still have not experienced freedom in one or another area of our lives. As I sat there, I just had this conviction that all three groups are people whom God wants to touch this evening. God wants you to just surrender to Him. Again, just before the song is sung. Group number one, God has given you the freedom to know Him and to have a good relationship with Him. But you know you've drifted away. Group number two, God has saved you. And He wants you to be a blessing. And this evening you're saying, Lord, yes, I know that. Please make me a blessing. Group number three, you are still in need of freedom in your own life. The altars are open. We're not going to take long because there's water baptism after this. So very quickly, if you know God's speaking to you, come. Holy Spirit, we pray that the word that has come forth will indeed not return to God void. They will have accomplished the purpose for which it has been sent forth this evening through Pastor Li Ping. 
Lord, we want to live responsibly. We want to, Lord, be a blessing. Use us, Lord. Holy Spirit, take us. Let us glorify Jesus. Lord, we want also your strength, your grace, your liberty to continue to be at work in our lives so that we can be set free from what, Lord, you are not pleased with and set free to be who you want us to be, Father, and to do what we want you to do. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity for us to move on in our lives and to be a greater blessing. Now bless each one around the altars and all of us who have heard the word. And bless the remaining part of our service, Father, in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.